Good morning. Everybody doing good? Man, it's fun to be here. Man, girl, I'm going to write that down. If you ain't hungry for Jesus, you're full of yourself. I was like, what? I thought I'm going to preach that sometime, somewhere. <laughs> you're going to hear that on YouTube right there. <laughs> what? That was good. Oh, my goodness, Lord Jesus. One of the first things Holy Spirit taught me in my life when I got saved in 95 was that I can't rise above my motive, that the why behind my life decided where I'd end up and how high I would fly. It was very impacting and very powerful. When Pastor Phil's talking about fear, I just want to expound on something a little bit. And, and, it, and he didn't, he, I'm just going to expand. It's not, I'm not correcting or just trying to add to what he said. What he said was great. But I want to give you a, a little nugget on fear and how to live free from fear. When you change your motive in why you're alive and you allow the gospel to change the why in your life, fear has no place. There's a reason the Bible says that you love not your own life unto death. There's a reason the Bible says your life is not your own. There's a reason the Bible says you don't seek your own. It's not just your life. You're not a Christian to get by, to survive, to get provided for, protected, you're a Christian to manifest Christ in the midst of whatever it is you're in the midst of. Yes. Yes. And when you understand that and embrace that in prayer, and you understand what it means to give back what was never yours in the first place, your life. See, it was always his life in you from the beginning. And we teach Christianity in a way of provision, blessing, protection. We preach beneficial message after beneficial message. It seems to keep people interested in coming, but it also sets you up for discouragement, fear, worry, and your circumstances are always whispering. And even when things are good, there's always a whisper. How long will it last and will it change? And all of a sudden, there's this self-focus and self-centeredness and self-consciousness that you don't even realize that seems normal. And all your prayers are about you getting something more and getting something better or something being less. And that's where fear is always found. His perfect love casts out fear. We get that. We quote that. But if your motive in life isn't aligned to truth, fear still has a voice. You're still worried about you. You're still worried. You're still trying to protect yourself in things when he's your rock and defense. What's that mean? Jesus said, hey, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Jesus let us know. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But in me, you have peace. So be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. What's he saying? I brought a different mindset. I brought the light. I brought the wisdom of God. I'm showing you another way, but it's the way. There are so many people that are Christians for another reason. I'll say it gracious and say it that way. People become Christians for another reason. They don't become a Christian so that his life comes into them and shines through them and packs others. They don't become a Christian for transformation and change. Their marriage is struggling. I better go to church. I just got laid off. I'm going to start reading my Bible. It's usually something that drives us to God that we need. And fear always lives there. When you're the focus, fear always has a voice. So I'm just clarifying, I'm expounding, because Pastor Phil didn't say anything wrong. The song's not wrong, but you can sing, I, I fear you don't have a place because I belong to Jesus. But if you don't belong to Jesus for the right reason, then fear has the same power it had before you confessed that. Are you all okay? Come on, this is real stuff. The motive in your life is huge. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 with me real quick. It was just in my heart when, and, and, and you know, there's another thing, I, I, I just love it. And I know you, you guys, you know, the Bible says about honor and some of you have been so gracious and, and you tell me your life's changed and you cry and I love it. It's the best testimony. When a spouse tells me their spouse's life's changed, that's even better testimony. <laughs> But I want you to understand this. This is real. And I'm saying this in sincerity. There's, there's, 
a lot of people, there's, there's people that don't agree with things I say. There's people that don't, don't, probably don't like me. But there's a lot of people, a lot of people that take the time to send an email and say thank you and say gracious things and honor me. I pass people in the airport, especially before this whole mass thing. And I, I would get tagged in airports and, hey, and oh my gosh, and people cry and hug me. And, and it's humbling and it's beautiful. But never forget this. Nobody has a thing unless it's been given. There's no better than, superstar, higher than. There's no, nobody has a thing. There's no boasting in men. I know we show honor to those who teach and labor, and I get that. Honor is just recognizing Christ in someone and allowing what you recognize to have place in your life to become your own reality. When, 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 when you honor a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive the righteous man's reward. What it means is what you honor becomes your own reality. So you, we honor people, understand, but listen, there's no boasting in men. Nobody has a thing unless it's been given. If you get this sermon, a word of knowledge, if you say, hey, you have this going, we're amazed by that. We go, whoa, whoa, I can't believe he knew that. And we turn to ten, turn, tend to turn them into somebody spooky or somebody super connected or somebody, and we always weigh spirituality by the manifestation of a gift. Look, it's grace. It's empowerment. God gives gifts to men. Christ gives gifts to men, right? It's no boasting in men. If God didn't let you hear, you wouldn't know. If God didn't let you see, you wouldn't see. So I'm just, I'm just clarifying something. There's, there's, no, there's no greater Christian than another. There's nobody even, watch this, nobody even more valuable than another. God's not biased. We all cost the same. And if you all cost the same, it means you all have the same value. What it means is you can all walk in love. You have a different sphere of influence. You have different giftings, different graces, calling. You have different desires. There's so much diversity in this room. It's absolutely ridiculous. You couldn't measure the diversity of preference and flavor and desire. And you couldn't even measure it in this room. And yet we can all live as one and one spirit and one mind and one faith. Why? Because we can all live for the same reason, for the glory of God, for his great name, to walk in love, to shine as a light. You're not going to live that way if anything has to do with just you. If you're just in this for you to catch a break, for you to get a promotion, for your marriage to go good. You can't be a Christian for your marriage to go good. You're a Christian to become the person he created you to be and become what he paid for. That will minister to your marriage. You could have a spouse that wants nothing to do with the Lord. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, you'll let that decision dictate you and what you have in the Lord. And you might still go to church, but you're forlorn, you're broken, you're hurt, you're stereotyped, and you're marked by one person's actions, and it's not Jesus. Your motive in life is huge. And when you understand and see that he first loved you, and you respond back and love him, that's healthy and clean. And then what happens is you begin to see him for who he is through that love and you begin to get a good look at how he sees you and who you really are in him. And now you have the best identity and view you've ever had in your life. And when you open your eyes in that place and look out, all of a sudden you see people for who they are. And now you're ready to love your neighbor as yourself because it's finally healthy and in line with truth. Do you know a lot of people can't love their neighbor like their self because they don't even like their self? So the way they see themselves is how they see others. So people bother them, get on their nerves, they're nitpicking, they see what's wrong with people because they're fault finding in their own heart. They look in the mirror and all they see is what they wish could change about them. So they see others and all they see is what they'd like to change about them. You love your neighbor as yourself. It's scriptural, it's spiritual, it's the truth. And the way you see you is the way you see others. It's the reason people don't value others because they don't value their life. Because they weigh their life by their own life, by their own experience, by their own memories, by their own failed actions. So their own resume is their own value. No, what God created you to be, who you are created to be in him is where you find your value. The blood of Jesus erases everything that you're weighing yourself by. 
The standard you've measured your value by, Jesus isn't even considering. It's actually forgotten through his blood. Jesus sees you for who you're created to be. Jesus sees you for who you'll look like when he's in you and you're surrendered. He said, man, that's worth paying my life for. I'm, I'm ready to pay my life to get my life inside of them so that I can live my life inside of them and multiply myself through the many that would believe. And the things I do, they'll do and even greater things because man, I'm about to multiply myself in those that believe. We've turned it into a tend to good church, make sure you pay your offerings and tithes, try to do a good few good deeds, and then believe for blessings, protection, provision. And if any of those arenas get threatened, I'm concerned and I'm praying because I smell trouble. That's not Christianity, and I'm sorry that anybody ever implied that it was. Because when I read my Bible, it has nothing to do with why we're Christian. Nothing to do. How's that? Look, our God, our own God will bless us. You don't have to spend one ounce of energy praying for blessing. He'll bless you. You live in him and you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you need to follow him will always be in your life. It will all be added unto you. If he did not spare his own son, Romans 8, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things through the son? What's it mean? Everything necessary to do what he paid for. Some of us get tricked into trying to survive. We're like trying to make it. You already did. You're already in. You say, yeah, but I'm hurting, you know, trouble and trials. I got laid off. I lost two loved ones this year. It's been a rough year. No, that's because you're getting your eyes off the bigger picture and faith is being subverted through emotions and feelings. And now you actually believe you have a reason to despair or be discouraged instead of rejoice that life is eternal and Jesus paid a price and nobody's losing when they're believing. And this is one little temporal time, one little wisp of a vapor, guys. It's one little temporal time. And you don't put all your chips on making it here. You put all your chips on living for his glory in that day. You make this life matter for when you stand before him in that day that just live by faith, not discouragement. They don't weigh their circumstances and decide their disposition. Their disposition is decided by what they believe. Are you with me? I know it's intense, but this is, it's, it's important. Fear, fear, you just don't pray it away. You get the right motive in life. And you wake up and you sincerely develop this in prayer and communion with God that nobody owes you a thing. Nobody owes you a thing. My spouse doesn't even owe me a thing. Guys, come on. If you're not married yet, please don't find a spouse to meet your needs. You'll be sorely discouraged. What was called love, you won't even be able to find it in a few years. And you'll say, I fell out of love. No, you never understood it in the first place because love never fails. But the thing about love is it doesn't seek its own. The thing about love is it takes no account, no account, no account of the wrong done to it. How can it possibly take no account to the wrong done to it? Because it loves and it doesn't seek its own. That's why God's not sitting there turned off by you. That's why God's not offended. That's why he didn't give up on you. That's why he didn't cross his line because he doesn't have it. Because he loves you. And you might have lived unlovable, but he doesn't see you for what you've lived. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. What's Jesus saying? These people don't have a clue who they are. He came to his own. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him. And yet his own knew him not. Truth spoke in the streets for three years. He wasn't speaking just the truth. He was the truth. Imagine the conviction, the anointing, the authority. He wasn't teaching theology. He's the word. He's made flesh. He can't say it any clearer. It can't be more authoritative. It can't be any more powerful. And yet men had the capacity to kill him for what he said. That should sober all of us analytical, human reasoning, intellect, sitting there listening, hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, you know, I just don't agree with that. Well, you know, puffed up in our own pride, puffed up in our own opinion, that men could crucify Jesus for his word. (laughs) 
We fight over the word today in the church. It's absolutely so sad because there's anger, animosity, criticism, judgment. There's no love. It's just you're wrong. I'm right. You're not going to heaven. We are. Uh, we don't agree. Well, we don't believe that. Well, that's not for today. Well, that stopped a long time. Well, why are you preaching? Well, that's heresy. Ah, e, ah, ah. Well, I'm just trying to protect people from your heresy. Ah. And it's amazing. God's never been mad at me. I've never experienced that in my intimacy with him. It's amazing how he'll just still give me information and understanding for somebody beside me on a plane. It's amazing how somebody in public will just cry in a parking lot and don't have any more pain anymore. I'm going to stick with where I'm heading and where I'm at. I'm going to let your animosity just fall to the ground. I'm going to trust that in that day, I was on the right track. I got all my faith wrapped around that because there's fruit when I look back. You get what I'm saying? No, I'm feeling a little roostery right now. I'm ready to crow right now. I'm, I'm ready to give my best rooster crow right now. No, I'm feeling barnyard right now. <laughs> but I'll calm down. And that's not arrogance. That's like there's confidence in arrogance. You're supposed to have confidence before God. If you don't see how he sees you, you don't have confidence. You're coming to him with a veiled face. Your only communion with God is your prayer list, your needs, your wants, what you're hoping he does for you. And it's impersonal and you're coming from him from a distance. He wants you to go through the door into his throne room of grace. He wants you to do it boldly, Hebrews 4. Not arrogantly, boldly, confident. Hebrews says, don't throw away your confidence. It has great reward. It says you have need of endurance, so after the will of God is fulfilled, you can receive the promise. That means you'll never fulfill the will of God without endurance. That means there's always challenges. Somehow we got this idea that we're believing for a better day instead of believing for a Christ-filled day. To walk in the light as he's in the light. Come hell or high water, I know what he looks like in the moment, and that's what people need to see. And that's the only reason I'm alive. Amen. Wonder if you get that narrow and wonder if your single eye brings light to your whole vessel no matter what's going on. And wonder if fear has no place to even exist in that arena. Because yeah. you love not your own life. If you're a Christian for you, please pay attention. If you're a Christian for you, you will never run well and you will live a roller coaster. And you will never flourish if you're a Christian for your own sake. Because there's no such thing here. And yet we've painted that picture and sent that message for probably two generations. That you're a Christian for you. Come, he'll meet all your needs. Whatever you need in this room, he's here to do it. That's a good way to run Holy Spirit off. A lot of your needs are wants. A lot of your needs, you're saying, I won't be okay until this. I won't be free until this, my husband changes. I won't be free till my wife straightens up. And you're praying for them to change, and you're letting them be your barometer of expression. And now you have a justification for not looking like Christ, and you're making it another person. That's deception. It's a wrong motive in life. You say, well, you don't know what I've been through. Have you considered what he's been through? Or is this just all about your journey? Or did your eyes get off of you when you embraced him and received him and all things died when you got born again so everything new could live? That's what it means to be a new creation. You don't come to God just because you recognize you were a sinner. You come to God to give up what was never yours, your life. And yes, you come to God because you were a sinner and you want to get forgiven of your sins and it's huge and it's vital and don't hear what I'm not saying. Yes, it's important, but that's not, it doesn't stop there. It's the beginning of a doorway that opens for you to come into him and him to come into you. Are you with me? And that is designed to change everything. <laughs> okay, I'm bringing it right now. You okay? That means complaining stops. And even if it slips out, you catch it. That means frustration stops because it's not about you. You can't complain unless you're self-centered. You can't be frustrated unless you're self-centered. You can't be angry unless it's all about you. You will never be frustrated in a point where you're frustrated at the cost of another, the expense of an identity, if you're not self-centered. 
Guess what else? Every sin ever committed by a man flowed out of the foundation of self-centeredness. See, we don't even teach that. We just teach Jesus didn't sin because he was deity. He was also selfless. So sin has no platform. I wonder if Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. I wonder if Jesus had an idea what he's talking about. I wonder if he's wise. We all say we believe he's the Lord. Why don't we take him totally at his word? I'm not correcting you. I'm cheering you on to be a believer like you've never believed before. That's all we can be. The only thing we should be guilty of when we stand before God is we believed and our lives prove it. Our lives prove it. Our attitudes prove it. The way we handle relationships prove it. Our disposition proves it. Our marriages prove it. We're believers. You say, well, my spouse doesn't want to run. Well, you're not limited. You're no less anointing, no less a child. Stop finding your identity through your spouse. I know it's tough. I know you have to walk through things. I know there's some feelings that try to rise up. But the truth is this. The raw truth is this. No matter what your spouse decides to do, the truth still stays the same and you have to answer for it. So if you let what your spouse does soften your heart in your heart or discourage your heart and you don't keep your heart soft towards God and you get stereotyped over your go through and it becomes your story instead of he's your story. The thing you're going through will limit your life. It'll mark you. It'll label you. And somehow it'll kind of become a part of you, what you've been through. It's my story. This is my journey. Well, if your journey's not producing life, find a way to shake it off and find a new place to find life. The last thing you need to do is get reduced to receiving sympathy. I'm not being insensitive right now. I know we've been through some hard things. But let me tell you the truth. Sympathy will not set you free. And if you get reduced to the highest grace you can receive is somebody seems to care about your story, that's not freedom. That guarantees you'll stay there because then you'll live for sympathy. And your story becomes your language, your introduction. And when you meet a new person within four or five sentences, you're talking about it. I got to read this. It's here. It's still here. It didn't change. Wow, we turned there a while back, and it's still here. And it didn't change. Being a little facetious. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. But my word, boy, would do us good to believe it. Not quote it, not sit under it, not amen it. Believe it. To where the word becomes flesh and our life lived reveals what we actually believe. And when we stand before God, we don't have to fill out a questionnaire because there's not going to be one. Your life will reveal what you believed. Your life lived will reveal if you loved yourself or if you loved God. Your life lived will will reveal if you were self-centered motive or if you died and loved not your own life unto death. Every compromise... Reveal self. You said it amazing. If you're not hungry for God, you're already full of yourself. What? <laughs> wow. He made all of us with an intention, with a plan. Yes. And he changes not. Right. So whether you step into the plan or not, the plan's still there. The reason people think life is a grind and tough and a bleep and a blip and a blank is because every day they wake up and live outside of why they're here. And then they wonder why they feel like life is dry or hard or tough or a grind. Because you're not receiving any grace to empower you. You're on a road you were never called to travel. Why would God fill your gas tank to drive a road you were never called to be on? So you're on your own. And now you're dreading life and despising life and living your whole life trying to figure out life. I just wish I knew what I was here for. You're here to shine. You're here to shine. You're here to suffer for doing good and take it patiently and not let anything change who he is. Because he changes not. They rejected him. They despised him. My goodness, they beat him and put him on a cross. They stripped him naked. They, it was the greatest injustice ever because he's totally perfect, pure, and innocent and deserved nothing and took it all. But they couldn't change him. They couldn't change him. 
They couldn't test him enough to change him. They couldn't bicker enough to change him. Why? Because he knows who he is. And he knows who he came from and why he sent. He said, I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. He's always with me because I always do what he asks. And he's love. And he just kept loving people. And people weren't lovable by human standards. And he just kept loving people. Why? Because he sees them for more than what they seem. And he knows the hidden truth of why they're here. And he knows the purpose of God. And he knows they're all eternal value in him. And he's here to redeem it, to save what was lost, and pay the price to get it back. And then we teach a gospel that brings us to God for blessing. Instead of covenant. For everlasting life instead of life on the inside. To fix our broken things instead of change us forever. Come on, don't you buy in to a gospel that's not. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. Scripture. That means you don't sell out because you're not for sale. You're bought, sold. Yay. Man, that makes me happy. Most people have a sellout price. Most people compromise their conscience, their mood, their attitudes, their emotions. People have un unspoken chips on their shoulder and unspoken lines, and they're okay up until, and I'm all right, yeah, but. Come on. Man, I want to be alone when you're not looking. I just want to be alone when you're not looking. I just want to become what he paid for. I just want to be with him and have grace come in and change everything about me that was never supposed to be. I want every ounce of Adam out of me. And I want the Spirit of God to fill me. I don't want to look through the eyes of the flesh. I want to live by the Spirit. I don't want to be conformed to the world's way and the way that seems right to man to have one sentence in the file of my soul. I want the way that's right in the sight of God to live in me. So when I'm alone in prayer, I talk to him about that. All I can do is surrender. All I can do is be clay. All you can do is be clay. And all you can do is submit to the great hand of the potter and be molded in that place of surrender, be etched and molded and shaped. And when he removes the veil and the tarp, ta-da, you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were predestined before time that you might walk in them, Ephesians 2. Ain't that powerful? Man, I'm preaching good in your church. It just feels good. This is where you are when nobody's looking. If all you do is seek him in the gathering, you get your reward in the gathering. Whatever you get in the gathering is your reward in full. But when you seek him in this place, yes. he who is in secret, he'll slip up on you. Yeah. He'll see you there. And he'll reward you in the open. Well, what are you seeking? What's your reward? More money? Full vats? You're seeking him. He sees you in secret. What's your reward in the open? Him. Yeah. That when you're treated wrong, you don't even know how to be treated wrong. When you're betrayed, you don't live betrayed. You ain't telling the man you don't know at the gas pump how betrayed you just were this morning. You're peeking around the gas pump, maybe freaking him out. Hey, bud. How you doing, man? Apart from these prices. Everything going good? And when you make contact, you'd be amazed how God intervenes. You don't even know the man. You're a little uncomfortable, but you make contact. Hey, bud, how you doing over there? Yeah, I know the gas prices are a little challenging, but hey, you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm cool. Wow, what? you got a son. Yeah? Do you know me? No, but something's going on. You're really concerned as a daddy. I see it in your heart. You're carrying weight, man. It's for your boy. Who in the blank are you? How do you? No, that's true. Listen, man, I'm just a man that loves Jesus. He lives in me. He's showing me your heart right now. I want to pray for you. And if you'll seek God right now and you ask him for wisdom, and you'll start surrendering and submitting your life to him and trust God with the welfare of your son because you can't carry that weight, friend. It's going to press you down. It's hurting you right now. You're not even focusing on your job. Dude, it's like you know me. He does. No, at least I could tell you so many of those. I'm not going to do that 
if I'm self-consumed, if all I care about is the gas pumps and who the president is, if I'm just mad at politics and I got names in my mind that I feel mean towards. Now I'm a thousand miles away from the heart of God, caught up in the world that I'm not supposed to consider or be entangled by. How's that for conviction? Because if I'm caught up with issues and got a life subscription to issues and don't cancel that, I'm reading an issue and I'm not reading him. Now I'm pumping gas, murmuring under my breath, cursing leadership, wondering how bad it's going to have to get. And Jesus is a million miles away, but then I run to church because it's service time. Sobering, isn't it? Sounds like religion. That man on the other side of the pump, you're the best chance he's got. God's put all his money, all his chips, meaning all his currency, Jesus' blood. He's put it all on you. And he didn't feel like he was gambling. You're the best he's got. You're the roster of heaven right here in Arkansas. And if we just start thinking this way and living this way, just this room, you can't weigh the impact in six months, in a year. You can't even weigh the seeds. So how are you going to even consider the harvest? And we're all praying for God to move. And he's saying, get up and move. We're all praying for a move of God. He's saying, I already did. I'm waiting for you to stop thinking for yourselves and flooding me with all these email prayers. Help, please, more. Oh, ah. Man, this is good. It's your fault. You started this off good. You got me stirred up. That was good. I've got to write that down. We're going to preach that next week. I'll preach that on the plane. Somebody can pour a guy's going to be sitting beside me. Hey, hey, bud, you hungry for God? What? Well, you don't even know what I'm saying, so you must be just full of yourself. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I got to say it. Just, I got to try it. No, no, I'm not going to do that to a man. <laughs> It was good, though. <laughs> Did we turn to 2 Corinthians 5? You're all there, aren't you? Wow. <laughs> I, I tease people. I say I calm down to preach. People say, it doesn't look like it. No, I'm, I'm being super calm. Super calm for you so I can communicate. So you don't get stumbled because the Bible says if we're besides ourselves in verse 13, it's for God. But if we're of sound mind, it's for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming here believing I'm in sound mind and maybe not in some of your minds, but for the love of Christ compels us. What compels us? Not the promotion, not my new relationship. It's the love of Christ that motivates my heart. He's the gas in my tank. The love of Christ compels me. My job, my marriage, my relationships should flow out of this compelling. You feel what I'm saying? You get fulfilled in Christ. You get complete in Christ. He's your shepherd. You shall not want. You live your life from that place. It affects everything in your life because you're living from fullness, not need, not weakness, not vacuum. You'll never live at the expense of someone when you live in that place. That's the design of God. Love lays down its life for another. The opposite of love lives at the expense of people. Are you with me? Yeah? Love covers a multitude of sin. The opposite, all I can think about is what you did wrong, and I can't believe you did that, and how could you do that to me? Well, how could you? I wouldn't be if you didn't. Well, you should have never...
It's amazing how we freely talk like that even after we're saved when we can't ever find Jesus acting like that. You can't ever find Jesus acting like that. So he's a good teacher. And you only have one teacher. He's the Christ. So if Jesus didn't teach us that, where'd we get that? And why aren't we convicted about that in our life if he ain't saying that and we're made for his image and we're supposed to be following him and as he is, so are we in the world. And when you see him, you see the father. So the father ain't even saying this. Are you with me? So I guess we've been trained by a lie. I guess we've been taught by the wisdom of the world. I guess self-centeredness has been in the root and the core of our life since we were born. Because we were born in Adam and you must be born. We turn that into a ticket to heaven when we die. We make sure we get people right before they die. Or we say, if you're going to die and you aren't ready, pray this prayer. And we don't teach him what they're really doing. They're giving their life so his life becomes theirs and everything's changing. Yes. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And I understand Holy Spirit has worked with the way we've evangelized. He's merciful and he works with But why not just give people the whole message? Why just preach beneficial stuff and give people the privilege to be discouraged? Or disappointed. Do you know how many people go to church discouraged on a Sunday morning? And they seem discouraged, look discouraged. People draw attention to their discouragement. And they think they're being spiritual. And compassionate. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, it's just a tough week. Oh, let's just pray. God, I just... And we call that compassion. But something needs to change. Motive, mentality, self-centered, self-focused. That needs to die. Somebody needs to sit somebody down and say, hey... Your perspective is destroying you. You're not waking up for the reason that you're called to wake up. Your reason for being needs to shift. You've turned inward. You're self-focused. All your prayers is about you getting something else or more or needing something instead of becoming something. Are you with me? Self-centeredness and feeling sorry for yourself is the loneliest party you've ever been to. Come on, and the only people that attend the party are the people that understand your pain. And they call, you call them friends in your season, your support. Yeah, you're guaranteed to stay there. Because you just talk about the pain and you all relate because you all have your story. And that's your support group. People that can relate. I don't need you to relate to what's not producing life. I need you to grab me and shake me and say, hey, bud, there's a better way to think. Hey, bud, stop feeling sorry for yourself. I'm sorry they made that decision. I'm sorry your spouse just took off and ran off with him or with her. But listen to me. That doesn't change who you are in Christ and you still have destiny in front of you. And you're letting the act of that one person called spouse because of the importance they had in your life and because of their title and who they were supposed to be and some of your expectations that were on them from them that you were supposed to get that didn't happen. Now you have a justification to be here and this is not God. Are you following me? You got to talk to people like that and explain. I can't tell you how many people I've sat down with tears and talked like, you're not arrogant. You're not saying, hey, get over it. You're understanding what's happening. You're understanding their emotional duress. So you're speaking into their life the truth so their mind can get changed. So they can see different. Because the eye is the lamp of the body. And if I don't change what they see, there's no light coming. But if their eye starts to change and now they give me a voice and they get some liberty and they go, oh my goodness, and they start seeking God and praying. Now their eye starts getting narrow and even more. And all of a sudden it's single. And if your eyes single, your whole body's flooded with light. It doesn't say unless, of course, your spouse just ran off with somebody. It says if I see clear, I'll be clear. It doesn't mean you don't have to walk through some emotions. It doesn't mean you don't have to deal with some things and kids and the family and change. And it doesn't mean there's not some uncomfortable moments that you got to step through. But man, if you're not in this for the right reason, you're going to get destroyed here. And you're going to become a testimony of that, and that's going to be you and your life and my book, and this is what I've been through. Not being mean. I'm not being insensitive. Let's not be identified by something we were never created for. You can't find your identity through any of those things. It'll never be healthy, and you'll never walk in the light. You'll stay self-focused till the day you die. 
and you'll feel sorry for yourself till the day you die. And you only have a few friends in your life that cry with you. That's lonely. That's not cool. And then you're going to stand before God and look into his light and his glory and his wisdom. And you're going to go, oh, no. And you're going to see. And everything's going to be crystal clear in the light of who he is and all darkness is exposed. And probably the best you'll do is go, oops. Oh, my. I let things matter more than what mattered most. Man, I so fixed on the lie, I actually became an expression of it. Oh, my goodness. I didn't afford mercy. I got my heart hard, and now I received no mercy. I became the very thing I'm angry with. My heart's been hard as a stone for 20 years. I've been mad at him. I've been mad at her for 20 years. I think because I cut them off, I'm winning. They were sculpting me the whole time. They were a major part of who I am today, even from 20 years ago. All that will be revealed in one moment. So it's better to talk about it now. Because yeah. if it ain't going to work then, why would we let it work now? And by time, we don't have to give. Redeem the time. The days are evil. Yes. Life is a wisp and a vapor, guys. You don't even have time to sit a week discouraged. You don't even have a time to try to get over something and say, look, you know, I know I'm supposed to forgive, but it's hard. Sometimes things take time. Ask Jesus if that's true. Or if you learn that in the world through self-centeredness. Because Jesus doesn't even have a grid for unforgiveness. We're trying to fit in forgiveness through confession. <laughs> like we have a grid for unforgiveness. And we know we're supposed to forgive. So we're trying to forgive. If you're trying to forgive, you're in unforgiveness. See, in Jesus, it changes the grid. It takes it away. Nobody owes you a thing. You didn't wake up and expect a thing from men, so you can't be disappointed by men. You woke up to shine, to walk in the light, to walk in love. You're in covenant and fellowship with God. You're one in Christ. Yeah? That's how Jesus says, the world, you're going to have tribulation, but in me, you have peace. Be of good cheer. I've overcome it. I pulled you out of it, but you're still in it, but you're not of it. And I don't even pray, Father, you take them out of it. Just keep them from the evil one by this message of love, by this light that I brought to men, by showing them the, not a, the, not a, the way. He said, follow me, not pray to me when you're overwhelmed. He said, follow me, not sing to me at worship time. He said, follow me. Yeah? Yeah? I'll bet we'd do amazing if we'd take him up on that one. I'll bet everything would change. I bet our hearts would go free. Oh, we'd sing like little birds. We'd sing better than birds. These guys would never have to plow the ground to get you engaged. They'd never have to do this. I've heard it so many times by worship leaders. I want to tell them, stop it. I'm not mad at them, but stop it. Watch. Look, I know you guys, a lot of you are carrying in the week. A lot of you guys are... You had a hard time and you've been challenged on your job. Some of you guys have some family struggles and you, I know you carried that in this room, but let's just put that off for a minute and lay it all down and let's just get our focus on Jesus, all right? Sounds like spiritual. It's so wrong. Rather than, hey, I'm glad you guys are here. You know you're free no matter what happened this week, no matter who said what and did what. Man, don't get your identity wrapped around the way life's unfolded and the things that happened to you. I'm telling you, you have a higher answer in Christ and we're going to worship the one that's our answer. We're going to give praise to the one that makes us free. Man, I hope you didn't come here carrying weight because that's a lie, friend. I hope you let that at the door and make sure you don't pick it up on the way out because it's a lie, friend. So we're going to have a time of our life tonight. We're going to worship him. He's going to invade this place. How about it? Ooh, right? Right? Yeah? See, when we lead church, like, and then a lot of pastors say, listen, I'm so glad you're here. The music's right. And we almost get a form and a style. And I'm just glad in everybody, and I'm telling you, and that music's perfect, man. The music almost makes you just believe everything that's being said. And I'm telling you tonight, God is in this place. I'm telling you, God is in this place. And he's here. You need to be encouraged. If you've got a need, he's in this place. And he's here to meet every need. He's not here to meet every need. He's here to make you more like him. 
some of your needs are idolatry. They've become idolatry. They've made you who you are. And until it changes, you won't be better. He's not going to meet the need and empower you to live in idolatry. He wants your heart to change. It's not even healthy. It'd be like the mama giving the lollipop. She said, she said, son, when we get to that cash register, I don't want you pointing to them racks. I don't want you putting me in that place you've done the last time. And I don't want you saying, I need this. I want this. Son, no, I don't want it today. You hear me? Do you hear me? They get up to the register. Mommy, what? I want a lollipop. Son, I told you. Don't ask me for anything. Oh, sorry, ma'am. Yeah, right. Mom, I want a lollipop. I want a lollipop. Don't you do that to me. Look around. Mom's nervous. Oh, here we go again. I want a lollipop. You ever see it? Fall on the floor? Boom, 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 boom. Kicking them legs so hard. Looks like they're doing some kind of exercise. Listen to me. Here, listen. I'm going to give it to you. Don't you ever do this again. Somehow we think that's the Lord. My wife prayed for me to change for 13 years. I never changed. I ran her battery dry. I ran her out of gas. She didn't have a revelation to handle me. She was a young Christian when we met, and I didn't feed it. I taxed it. I called her. I called it love. I called her my wife and told her I loved her. I didn't even know what love was because God wasn't in me. But it was easy to say I love you because it was emotion that was driven by need. And she was in position to maybe help me meet those needs. So I reduced her identity to serving me. And I'm on the earth to love her. And now she's in my life to meet my needs and she can fail me as much as she can bless me. And I can say I love her and just as quick curse her. That is so self-centered and demonic. And we tend to do it all the time after we're saved. She prayed for me to change for 13 years and I never changed. When she gave up on me and said, I'm done with this marriage, I said, great, I've been waiting for this. I've wasted my time with you anyway. What am I even doing with you? And I was so mean, arrogant, vanity. It was terrible. And... She went in the bedroom and made herself not cry and said, I'm done letting this man make me cry. And she, you could see her just harden herself on the porch as I degraded her and berated her. And she said she went in the bedroom and she said, and I'm done with you too. I am done with you. I prayed to you for 13 years. 13 years I prayed to you and you've done nothing. You have allowed me and these children to go through hell and you've done nothing. He's worse than he was. I don't need you. She walked off. See, people in pain understand her language. They're saying, see, see, that's what makes me so mad about God. Why is he... Five long months goes by. I get born again. She's livid. <laughs> I get transformed. I'm talking born again. I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. I got saved. Yeah, come on. And I was changed. Yeah. And my friends were freaked out. My coworkers were freaked out. Everybody was freaked out. Because I was changed. Made people uncomfortable. Because I was different. They're wondering who brainwashed me, who'd you get hooked up with, what caught are you a part of? Because I'm changed. And they're uncomfortable when you're changed. When you're not like them, they're uncomfortable. But my wife was livid because she thought I was pulling a stunt to make the family think that I was the good guy and she was the bad girl. And at least I'm trying and she's a witch and all that stuff. Because I told her that. I said, your family feels sorry for me that I married you. That's the stuff I said to my wife. Now I'm born again. She's livid. She went out of her way for seven weeks to prove that I wasn't saved. Go ahead and stretch your mind. She went out of her way 
to prove I wasn't saved. So that she could get me to stumble into whatever so she could go, aha, and relieve her own violated conscience. And seven weeks went by. And Jesus came in the bathroom and encountered her as she was doing her hair to go out somewhere. He just walked in there. And he said, she went, she told me she had the brush in her hand and went, because the one she pumped her fist at and cursed six and a half months ago was standing right there in front of her. She couldn't see him. She thinks she heard him. She's not sure. I said, it don't matter. But she knows he was there. He ain't mad at her. He ain't saying, see what this got you? You should have never told me off. He just said, Kim, why are you so angry with that man? Can't you see? And she said it was like somebody ripped something off her face. <gasps> that's not even the man you're angry with. Kim, that's not even the man you married. I made him a brand new man. She fell to the floor in a fetal position, crying her eyes out, crying her eyes out. The Lord hovers over her and he makes peace for her rant that day in the bedroom. Because he wants her to understand. He's not offended at her. If somebody talks to us like that, we'll cut them off. And think we're winning. He's right in the room making peace. He said, you know, it's true. You prayed to me for 13 years. But you don't understand how you tied my hands and kept me from ever moving or answering your prayer. Because you never prayed from the place of love. You only prayed from a place of pain. You were reduced to another hurting wife that prays. And you knew if I changed him, your day would go better. I can't change him and leave you there. He can't give the boy the lollipop. We think God's inclined to change our circumstances and make our world go better. And if not, we'll turn on him. That's not covenant. That's not my life is yours. That's he's your bus boy. And the steak ain't the way you ordered it. So there's no tip today. God is not our servant. He's our father. And for a Christian to be mad at God is an absolute expression of... It's ludicrous. It's total, total, total deception. Because it's an expression of complete self-centeredness. In the moment of your pain. But we justify it. And I've heard preachers say. I know it's easy to get mad at God. And everybody at some point has been mad at God. Why do we teach that stuff? We should make it impossible to be mad at God. Because we see him so clear. Because then when we sing a song that he's good. Half the room's wondering why. And how he's good. Because bang, 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 bang. We sing a song, he's never failed me yet. Really? Bang, 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 bang. Oh my, bang, bang, bang. Ain't that something? Hey, that was good. He said, Kim, when you pray, for, you never prayed for mercy, you never prayed from love, you only prayed from pain. I cannot answer your prayer and give you what you're asking and leave you there because it's not me. See, if we parented our children like that, we'd say shame on you for spoiling your child. But then we expect God to father us that way. She got up from that place crying out of control. She found me. She ran and found me. She charged me. She's crying out of control. I don't even know what's going on because she's mad. She won't, I, I'm thinking she's going to claw my eyes out all the time. She's running through the yard, running at me, a full sprint, blew through the garage door, running, crying out of control. And the first thing I thought was, somebody died. And it broke the barrier. Trauma, phone call, unexpected, tragedy. And she's running to me because somebody died, significant in her lives. That's what I'm thinking, and she's running. Plus, I'm looking for knives and guns and stuff. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I wasn't. She was crying so hard, so hard. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Hard as you can cry, heave, cry, hardly breathe and cry. 
but she's talking repetitively as she's running and I can't tell what she's saying because she's crying so hard. So until she got real close, like this close, like bang, and laid her head in my chest and wrapped her arms around me bawling. Now I'm bawling because I haven't even held my wife for six and a half months. I'm born again for the last seven weeks. I want to say I'm sorry. I want to be a, have the honor of being like Christ is to the church in her life. I want to love her for the first time in my life. I want to one day, just one day, I just want to love her where she knows it. Just one day. And now she's clinging to me, her head's pressed. Guess what she's saying repetitively? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I was a knucklehead. I was a jerk. I was angry, frustrated, unthankful for 13 years. I abused her with my words, my language, my unthankfulness. Who knows that now that I'm saved, I'm sorry. On a talk show, she's a victim and I'm a villain. But still nobody wins because we stay there. And now she's pressing me. One encounter with God, everything turns around. Her eyes are off herself. She doesn't know how to feel sorry for herself anymore. The whole rap sheet against me and the prosecuting attorney mentality is gone. And all she can say is, I'm sorry to me, who did nothing right for 13 years. That's amazing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. If Jesus wasn't there, we could have had our very first argument in our new life. We could have argued who's supposed to be sorry and who shouldn't be sorry, and I'm sorry more. No. Don't you ever hit your wife. Don't you ever hit your wife. He was talking about going, he went like this, and he bumped his wife in her head. I saw, I saw that domestic violence. I said, I have you guys in prayer right now. I'm in prayer. They're laughing. Don't you ever hit your wife. Are you kidding me? Don't you ever hit a man either. They punch you, you're supposed to turn your cheek because your life's not your own. You're manifesting Christ. When they crucified him, he didn't say a word. He went to the slaughter like a lamb and never said a word. Why don't we follow Jesus? Why are we always standing for our rights if we're dead? How do we have rights if we denied ourselves? I'm troubled by this stuff. Somebody needs to help me. How do we have so many rights? Why is all our counseling appointment people violating people? Why is 99% of pastor's counseling appointments people struggling with people? And we're going to change our community? I think we better first let him change us. Come on, I'm not being mean. I'm being real. My wife ran to me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, honey, stop it. Why could you pop? I'm crying so hard. It's a blubbering mess. We had fluid coming out of places it shouldn't even be. I think it was coming out of my eyebrows. It was bad. (laughs) We're bawling. And I said, honey, why would you be sorry? That almost bothers me to hear you say you're sorry. I've never loved you. I didn't live Christ one day in our marriage. I told you I was a Christian when we met. And I never lived Christ one day. I didn't even care about it. I've been so self-centered, such a hypocrite. It's terrible. And I've repented. And God has changed me. And I'm finally ready to love you. Kimmy, you, you don't have any reason to be sorry for anything. She said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. She couldn't even hear me. She didn't even need me to apologize. You know how we are. Somebody apologizes. We, we heard them and say, excuse me, what would you say? Same way when you need accolades. Somebody says, man, you're so awesome, huh? What? You heard him. It already is going down the right side. <laughs> now they say, you're just so awesome. Oh, now it hit the left. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't, man. No, 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 you're really, oh. <laughs> Come on, it's weird. That's why I'm acting weird. So you th- see, it's weird. So you don't live that way. Live for affirmation. Your affirmation is this. Your affirmation is a stone rolled away. The affirmation is the Spirit of God wooing you and drawing you to Christ and having a desire for God because no one comes to Him on their own accord except they be drawn by Him. Why would He draw you unless He wants you? I said, how can you possibly be sorry for anything? She looked me right in the eyes. And she said, I am so sorry for not loving you in prayer. I prayed to you, to God for 13 years to change you, but it was only because of my pain and my hurt and my anger and my frustration. God told me that I was reduced to another hurting wife that prays, and he couldn't change me and leave me there because it wasn't love, it wasn't him. And I went, wow. How many times are we only motivated by trouble? How many times is all our prayer that we pray because we're concerned, we're worried, we smell trouble, we see something, our child's going this way and we're freaked out and we're in the room crying, calling it faith. 
Instead of, did you not allow me to conceive that boy? Father, he has seed in him and investment. I don't know what he's going through. I don't understand his struggles right now. I don't know why he's even cut off my voice. I'm not offended. Your voice can't be cut off. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You're in him, working with him. This journey he's taking isn't under destruction. And I thank you, God, for your hand strong upon my son. And I appreciate your life in me and the sphere of influence I have. And I thank you, God. My faith is on that boy right now and you restoring him. And God, I'm not going to intercede and pray every day. I trust. Trust your hand is on that boy. And if you want me to speak anything, bring it to my mind. If you want me to think on him and say anything, you let me know. But I'm going to walk in the light and I'm going to leave this bedroom as a mother that has no son in trouble because my faith is in you and it is well. Yes. That's not denial. You're not letting your son's choice steal your disposition. Two birds aren't getting killed with one stone. I've watched countless parents as a pastor wrap their identity around their children and how their children are doing is defining how they're doing. And if their children aren't doing well, they get the condemnation hit. If I'd have done better, if I'd have parented better, if I, this has to be because of me. If we'd have done right, they wouldn't be doing this. That's not true. People make decisions. Sometimes they have every reason to do right and choose wrong. They have to come to their own knowledge, their own faith. They can't serve the faith of their daddy and mommy. They have to come to the knowledge of Christ. So you train them in the way they should go. You stay solid. You don't fall apart. You take responsibility for your life, repentance, you be humble, you communicate, and when they grow old, they won't depart. Why? Because of the seed, the investment, and the grace of God on their life. Yes. So why do we carry the countenance of the decisions of our loved ones? Because we're not in faith, and somehow we think we're failing, and we're wondering where God is. And somehow he ends up getting the blame. It's like, well, God allowed. Well, he didn't. Well, why'd he let my parents get divorced? I've had teenagers yell at me, mad, in churches. Pull them aside. Will you tell me why he let my parents get divorced? I said, that's a great thing. Wow, that you let me know you feel that and believe that in your heart. If you'll be humble and you'll, let's go get alone. I can explain that and answer that question for you. Easy. Let's go sit down if you're willing. And I'll watch that teenager cry and realize they've been deceived and angry at the only one that's good. Isn't it amazing how we're trained to turn on the Lord? How we're trained to be self-centered and focused to not even realize it. To pump your fist at God. And you allowed me and these children to go through hell for 13 years. Oh, it sounds like a movie scene. It sounds so right. And it couldn't be more wrong. When you look at what that's producing in a person, you can tell it's not right. Because it's given them permission to be what they were never created to be. And the precious time they have is slipping away. Wow, it's 11.52 already? Man, I done preached the word in your house though, buddy. No, I'm wrapping up. I'm done. I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this. We're going to pray. I'm going to turn it over to you. And you can close however you want. But you hear my passion? You hear my heart cry? Yeah. Listen, I'm here because I want to be. I'm here because I want to be. I, I'm not here for any other reason. I'm not here for the offering. I just told him a while ago, I said, look, man, what are you doing? You're taking a special offering today? No, we're not. I canceled the offering today. I said, you're wigging me out. You took an offering in an open service on Saturday and said, every penny's going to me. I'm sitting there squirming in my chair. Then he does it again Saturday and caught me off guard. And I'm like, now it's a little late. And then I heard special offering. I went, we're trying to hit three offerings? No, it's three strikes, you're out, pal. <laughs> so we're not doing an offering today. I am not here. I, I, it's not that I can't receive, and I'm blessed with the offering you took Friday and Saturday, and yay, and praise God. There's not a standard of giving. The, a pastor isn't worth a certain amount. There's no level. Somebody said, we've never had somebody at our church of your caliber. We wasn't sure what's good in giving. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'll pay my way and preach. I'm here because I want to be. I don't have to be here. I'd love to tell you the Lord came in my bedroom and said, go. <laughs> Respond to Pastor Phil and go. It just felt right in my heart. I read it and I said, I'll go. I had 97% of my invites laying there that I never fulfill because I only have so many weeks in a year. So I, I attend 3%. You guys are 3% of what I do. 3%. But I'm here because I want to be. 
If I was here for offering, I'd pick out every church that the pastor said that he pastors 3,000. I was in a church last week. It was so small. The man said, we're really small. I said, I called you, didn't I? I got hundreds of invites laying for me. I called you, didn't I? I said, you, I know you're trying to be courteous. I'm not thinking how big or small. I was never even going to ask how many people you are. No, but we're really small. I said, stop. I called you, didn't I? Well, I'm not sure how we'll be able to bless you, etc. So I said, stop. I buy my own plane tickets. Jesus gets me there. We don't have to take an offering. I'm not expecting an honorarium. This isn't a business deal. It's the kingdom of God. You following me? So here's why I'm telling you that. Everything I'm saying is because I believe it. And it's what I live, and I'm saying it for your sake, trusting that somebody is going to believe this and take even if half, if you take half of what I said, and it starts becoming your life, it's going to make a difference. So I'm excited. I'm here because I'm a believer. I'm here because I want to be. I didn't come to set you straight. I came to tell you who you are. I didn't come to correct you. I came to cheer you on in life in Christ. And I'm telling you, we can live this way if you're willing. And if you don't grow weary and well-doing and draw back, if you'll find yourself in this place when nobody's looking, Take the veil off and believe you can approach him because he sent Christ while you were yet a sinner. How much more are you saved from wrath now that he raised? And you be with him. Just be with him. Yeah? You know, when two people be with one another long enough at a certain level, somebody ends up pregnant. Do you ever notice that? Why don't you go be with them at a certain level and end up pregnant so that everything that comes out of your life looks like its father? Why don't you go be with him? Ooh, man, that's good. Look, I'll write yours down. You write that down. You can preach that. I'm going to preach yours. Okay, see, I have trouble. Ah, 1156. I didn't even read. If I read, this is trouble because then I got to preach a half hour for every line. No, I'm not going to do it. We're done. We're done. Pastor, don't worry. No fear. You belong to Jesus. No fear. You belong to Jesus. No fear. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> for the love of Christ is what compels me. It's the fuel in my tank. It's what my motor's running because of the love of Christ. And, be, and, and, and it compels us and be because we judge thus, not someone, we judge something, not, not someone, something. That if one died, hmm, if one died, then all died. Oh, this is scripture. You better get this stuff. If one died, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for who? Uh-oh. This is how you should come to the altar. Not if you don't know where you're going. If you die tonight, pray your, pray, raise your hand, every eye closed. You're living something that was never yours if you're not living it in him. He never made man to live his life. He made man to live his life in him. That's why suicide is one of the greatest, probably the most acted out deception on the planet that someone gets tricked into taking what's not even theirs. And humanity says, and the world says, well, it's my life. It never was, friend, from the beginning. You're not, you didn't come from a mud puddle. You didn't come from an ape. God said, let us make man in our image. And he made them both male and female in his likeness. And this whole journey of Christ is getting us back to that truth. So you don't live for yourself, but you live for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, because this is true, from now on, we see, identify, define, or regard no man is what it's saying. Regard no man according to the flesh. 
You don't see a man anymore for what he seems to be. You see a man for what he's created to be. And then love never fails. Because if a person knew who he was and was in love with God, he wouldn't do what he's doing if it's not God. So instead of being angry, we have mercy. Instead of crying because of, we cry for. Because we never judge according to what a man seems. Don't you ever read a book by the cover. Or you'll never get into the inward chapters of value, purpose, and destiny. Father, I thank you for the time in this house. I pray that people are motivated and stirred up in you. Not like a motivational speech, God. Stirred up in you. Stirred up to be with you. Stirred up to be loved by you and receive your grace. Father, what a gift. Let this mark every heart. What a gift. Life. Don't let one person despise the gift of life. Don't get one person, let one person be tricked into not valuing this gift called life. That mercy woke us up again today to give us one more day to follow you and look like you. I thank you, God, and I thank you for this house, and I thank you for what you're doing in this region. And I bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, buddy, 12 right on the money.